Hi, this is Gilbert O'Sullivan speaking. Thank you for watching Music News. Please subscribe here. Gilbert O'Sullivan, it's a pleasure to meet you. How are you doing? Very well, thank you, Michael. Good yeah. stuff. Um, when our Italian editor found out we were interviewing you, he said, one of the greatest pop songwriters of all time, everybody should have his greatest hits. Oh, how nice. True? Yeah, well, I'm not complaining. <laughs> How did you first get into the music industry? How did music first grab you, as it were? Uh, well, it was radio. It's just radio when you're a kid and stuff. Just radio. Just Radio Luxembourg. In England, you had the light program, which you didn't hear that much music when, you know, eight, seven or eight years of age. Just the radio. Connection with the radio. Pop music. And that and then, was... Yeah, that, that's just the start. And then, obviously, in the six, early 60s, with the emergence of the Beatles, you wanted to be in a band. So I was a drummer in a band. Yeah, started yeah. to write songs. Love Bob Dylan. Tried to sing like Bob Dylan. So to do, you know, so got more interested in being involved in music, and um, which led to a sort of a, a more serious band. The serious band, the leader of that band, went on to form Supertramp. So we were kind of both from Swindon, very close, and and then you know to try and make it as a singer, moved to London, get into record companies, to knock on doors, and serve an apprenticeship of three years, and then with a bit of luck and timing, you make it. Yeah, you certainly did. You're one of the biggest selling solo artists in the world at the height of the music industry. You know, what do you remember of that time in the 70s? Well, it's a good time. I mean, I have good memories of all the success I achieved. I mean, it's uh, nothing to look back on and regret. I'm pleased that I stuck with my image. I mean, because the way I looked, nobody liked it at the time. But I find that when I look back on it, I'm really kind of really pleased. If I looked back and saw pictures of me in platform shoes and flare trousers and long hair, I'd be, in, I'd be cringing. But when I see the pudding mason haircut I had, it actually looks very fashionable now. And the Chaplin jacket and stuff, I'm actually quite, I think it was, I'm really kind of pleased I did it, stuck with it. It's true, so it went against the grain. Absolutely. And, um, you know, that's set you apart. I mean, you've been covered by Morrissey, Neil Diamond, Dana Kroll, Buble, the list goes on. Which, which artist do you think has done the best job covering uh, one of your songs? Well, I, I, every cover is a compliment to a songwriter. So if you wrote a song, whoever does it, you shouldn't really be in a position to complain about it or criticise it. They're all good in, in their own way. I mean, I have a, a sort of um, um, uh, a sort of Black Sabbath version of Alone Again by a Japanese rock band, yeah. 200 miles an hour. I love it. It's kind of just madness. So, I mean, every, every cover version I, I find is a compliment. So I never sort of criticise. Yeah, no, it's no. nice. You know, it's nice they do it. So. Definitely. So, uh, You've gone for a Latin vibe on the, on the new album, Latin Elegy, mm. your 23rd. Mm. Uh, original songs inspired by Peggy Lee's Latin Alali. How did the idea sort of come together for that? Well, well the Peggy Lee thing is because in the, when, as a young songwriter, I was buying records by Peggy Lee, Ella Fitzgerald, because you learn your craft by listening to people who interpret great songs. So the early 20th century songwriters, the Rogers and Hearts, the Jerome Kearns, the Cole Porters, Peggy and Ella sang those songs. So you, as a, if you're learning your craft, if you want to be a photographer, you study the, the great photographers. If you want to be an artist, that's the great art. Music, you want to be a songwriter, listen to the great writers and stuff. So Peggy was one of those people I listened to. And she made two albums in 1960 called Latin Alla Lee and Ole Alla Lee. And um, so I've always wanted to kind of do a, a Latin type album. I mean, I write pop songs, no qualms about that. But it's kind of nice with each album that you make that you, you approach it differently. It's no good doing the same thing every time with the same musicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you got to a point where, well, what's the point of if he's doing the same thing? So therefore, even though you're the same writer, even though you're the same singer, by doing something a little differently, like this, going to Spain, recording with Spanish musicians, it was just, just great. And we've reproduced the cover. Uh, Peggy, did uh -huh. her, Peggy did her cover with two male matadors either side of her. So we've done the cover with two female matadors. So it's kind of like a homage to her. Yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. nice. You know. I mean, it's a real relaxed, enjoyable listen. I mean, what, what do you start, sort of, set out to impart to the, to the listener when you start on a project? Well, the first thing is to, to hope you come up with 12 good songs. So, yeah, as the writer, I hope I've got good enough melodies then to sit down with an empty notebook and start writing the lyrics. No idea at times what they're going to be about. So that's interesting. It takes as long as it takes. It doesn't happen overnight. And then you look at where you're going to record. We thought in the beginning we might do this in Brazil because of my love for early Brazilian, early 60s Brazilian, Astro Gilberto, yeah, yeah. Girl from Ipanema, Sergio Mendes, Brazil 66. But it was kind of difficult for us to go to, to Rio to do it. It was a big risk there. So in the end, we decided with the producer that I was working with, Peter Walsh, he's produced uh, 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 
uh, Scott Walker and Simple Minds in the past. And, and Peter has a good relationship with Spanish artists. So the connection really worked out really well. He knew good Spanish musicians. He knew studios. So we, a couple of weeks over there, magical time. Yeah, and um, you know, quite a lot, quite a sort of hectic schedule then. All no, not really. No, just really nice. Uh, it was, you know, it, it was just great. I mean, the thing about Latin is it's the rhythm thing. So we had a great percussionist, a great drummer, because I picked tunes that that would suit Latin. Ballads you can do in any kind of way. Ballads can always be done in Latin. So, mm. but the uptempo stuff, you really need that feel of. of of Latin musicians who are used to that kind of, it's very normal, natural for them. So it worked out really well. I'm mean, really happy with it. It's kind of, everything I kind of envisaged, it's taken many years to kind of come up with it, has kind of worked out. It's, I'm really pleased. So the songs I, I'm happy with, uh, the production with Peter and the recording, it's been really good. We're, we're still finishing off the cover, so, <laughs> so we're not quite 100% there yet. We're still covers going back and forth to the printer so that we get that absolutely right. But we're just about there. Yeah, nearly there. And um, I mean, it's a great album, a great listen. When, you, when you're writing that then, because mm. it's sort of got a Latin influence, mm. you, you, did that sort of come afterwards and you write the songs and then sort of flamenco it up in a way? Well, the uptempo stuff, if I write what I think is a melody, when I, when I say write, I want to do the Latin project now. So I look at the melodies I've got. You know, when I write as a songwriter, I do what, what um, Irvin Berlin does. You sit there for eight hours a day, or he, I'm not sure he did it for eight hours a day, but whenever he sat down to write melodies, as the writer of both melodies and lyrics, if he came up with a tune, he would put it in a trunk and move on. So what I would do in my writing periods, sit there for hours on end, if I came up with a tune, I'd just put it on the cassette and then, then move on and try and do some more. So when you come to make an album, if it's going to be a rock album, you look for the melodies you wrote that have that rock influence. If it's a ballad album you're looking for, you look at the melodies you had that were ballads. So you always start with the melodies. So I picked the, the melodies, particularly the up-tempo melodies, that would be suitable for a Latin feel. And then I would just sit down with an empty notebook and off, off we go and come up with lyrics that aren't necessarily Latin, because I tend to write about what you read in your, in your newspaper. I cover everything. Yeah. But, it, but the Latin feel is the most important thing. Yeah, so you've got a, a library there, a mm. vault of... Um, yeah, well, I'm not, it's not a vault, uh, Mark. <laughs> it's... it's it's enough for me to be able to pick and choose the melodies I want to use. Because the hardest thing to do as a songwriter, you know, for every ten songwriters you would know about, seven of them write lyrics, three of them write music. It's the hardest thing to come up with. And particularly as one gets older, you've got to re work really hard. I think as a lyricist, the likes of Paul Simon, Ray Davis, Randy Newman, are always lyrically brilliant. You never lose that, because yeah. I think it's something you're born with. But melodically, you can lose it. Why would you lose it? Because when you're young, you, you love what you hear on the radio. That influences you to write melodies. But as you get older, you might think, oh, I can't stand what I hear on the radio. I mean, George Harrison famously said in the 80s, I, he couldn't stand what he would hear on the radio. But, you, but a young George Harrison would have loved, because that's the only way yeah, that he yeah, would have yeah. heard music. So that's the key to sort of being a, a prolific songwriter these days, is to, is to work hard at the melodies. What's the best song you've ever written, do you think? I don't know. The, the people ask me what my favorite is. I have two favorites. One, the very first track I ever made in '67, which came out on CBS. That was magic just to hear on the radio. And then the first success with "Nothing Rhymed" in 1970. That was magic to be able to to know that people were were buying it in you know in, in large quantities. So that was those are the kind of very special things. Yeah, I mean you've got live shows coming up now in June. Do you, do you like being in front of, uh, of an audience? Yeah, yeah, it's very important, Marco. You can't just make a record and then say, right, I'm not going to go on the road to promote it. A quick pro quo, you've got to do it. And the nice thing is about a concert scenario, is unlike, say, a re a recording an album, recording an album, it's a close set, the musicians and you, the producer, the engineer, it's just you. It's, uh, it's intense and close, but very productive. But the thing about a live show is, you know, in front of 2,000 people, it, it's, it's magical. They get to see me, get to hear new stuff, the old stuff for their favourites, and I get to see who's still interested in me. So it's a, it's a two-way, uh, it's a, a wonderful experience. I love it. Yeah, great. I mean, and obviously you get to play your whole back catalogue. I mean, mm. why do you think that endures so well as well? Well, I hope it endures. I mean, we do two and a half hours, Jeez. so it's, it's only my songs. <laughs> so God help us if after an hour people don't like my songs. I have a pretty, a pretty um, sort of, uh, what would you call it, um, a varied back catalogue. So I have lots yeah, of, yeah. you know, all kinds of material. So over the two and a half hours, plus incorporating some of the new songs, it, it, it it works pr pretty well. Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, Gilbert O'Sullivan is probably in many people's sort of best albums lists. Mm. What, what, what do you have as, you know, what's in your best albums list? Of what for other people or from? Yeah, of other people, yes. Sir. Yeah, well, everybody from, I mean, I, I like everyone. I mean, I, I buy everything by everybody, the Adele's, the Ella Henderson's, the George Ezra's. I buy it all because it's very important to like what's going on. But I have, my, one of my favourite artists is John Mayer. I mean, I love John Mayer. He's a brilliant guitar player. I mean, I buy everything. I buy every CD you get to mention because it's important. You know, I may not get a lot out of it from a song point of view, but I will learn something about production. If I buy a Kanye West CD or a JD, JD, it's not the song I'll be listening to because it's he sampled a melody from the yeah, past yeah. and he'll rap over it. But the production will knock, you know, take your breath away. Rihanna's production just knocks me out. So I mean, those are the sort of things that these days, when I hear records, when I buy records, that I can listen and learn from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, now that this project's almost over, by mm. the cover, <laughs> have you got? Are you looking forward to any other projects? That's no, no, this is well. It's eighteen months now. This has come together. So now we'll spend the next six to nine months touring. Yeah. So starting in the UK, we'll go to Ireland, we'll go to Europe, maybe, maybe come to Italy, uh -huh. and um, then we'll go to. With it being a Latin album, we we expect to go into South America, and we have a one of the songs on the album is a duet with a Spanish artist, Iola, she sings in, Sp yeah. she, she does her version in Spanish, so it's th that's nice. So we have that kind of thing going on. And we have a track called Hablando del Rey de, which is a, a Spanish title, which is kind of interesting. So I, we, we have an element, so that will lead us, I think, into going down to South America. And we'll go to the States. So that will take up six to nine months. And then if I see you in the street, <laughs> I'm on to the next project, Marco. <laughs> are you going to have a holiday after that? No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's not like I'm... Uh, digging roads and working on a pit. I mean, it's 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 the end of a tour. Of course, you have a little break, and then you'll go home and think about the next uh, project and stuff. I mean, that's how I've never got off the treadmill. I've never been one of these people who's kind of got out of it and then come back. A lot of artists do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, Absolutely. particularly with live recording now. I mean, the reason a Springsteen and Dylan continue to work so much live is because they, their records don't sell anymore. Yeah, they don't, yeah. Any, your record sales have just dropped, but the live performance is massive. So more and more people are touring and more and more bands like Blur have just reformed, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Because they know on the live circuit they'll generate enough, apart from hopefully selling a lot of albums, which they won't really do in the marketplace, but certainly on the live front they'll do O2, two or three nights at the O2. Yeah. So you can see where that's, as a result of the downsizing of record sales, the upsizing of live performances uh, comes into play. Big yeah, time. yeah, absolutely. The Big live scene is probably better than it's ever been. That's, yeah, no you question. Say, that's where <laughs> the money is. Yeah, and right. I mean, you've seen the, the record industry at its highest, mm. at its lowest. And where do you think we are now? Well, it's, it, I don't really worry too much about it. I mean, because what can you do? Yeah. I mean, the technology is there. And my daughter, she runs the Facebook site for me, and she'll tell me about how is it that she and her generation go about buying records. They don't buy CDs. They buy, everything's on the internet. They listen. Yeah. If they like a track, they get it. But she did say to me that if they really like a track that much, albeit that they could get them all on downloading, she'll buy the album. If, so they, they, there's still a market for it. And vinyl suddenly exactly. has reemerged. That's, That's back, interesting. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I think it's, there are very few artists, you know, like um, a Blur can certainly put out a vinyl version. Uh, but I don't think that many artists can do it. But who knows? It's interesting how that's re-emerging, because my daughter, you know, our, our kids' generation, it's all about downloading and phone yeah. and app and... It is, it is, well. it's a technological yeah. minefield yeah. these days. Yeah, but, but the business, I, I like the business. I mean, I don't really mind if, there's, if nobody buys your records. That's not a reason for not doing it. I mean, I always find that what I like about where I'm at now is since about 1990, every two to two and a half years, I've released an album and I've gone out on the road to tour with it. So I sell cottage industry level, 25, 30,000 copies here and there, which is okay, enough for me to be able to go on and do another one. You want to sell millions, but you have no control over that, right? So, but the joy is that you, you've got the songs, you go in the studio, you record it, you make the album, you do the artwork. And you know, when you have that, it's a bit like hearing your record on the radio for the first time, to have that sort of album. You know, in your hand and think, well, you know, it really was worth all the effort. Without having sold one copy, there's a sort of a success that, that happens about that. It's kind of yeah, like, yeah. you know, you could sleep well at night. But, but, you know, because that's what you have control over. You don't have control over who might like it, who might want to buy it, who might be interested in it. And you shouldn't, because you know, if you get into that area, it'll affect your work process. I mean, I just, I'm really good at songwriting because I love songwriting. So nobody interferes with that. No, no matter what people think about me, when I'm writing songs, I'm in this kind of like a seventh heaven. As long as I have that enthusiasm and pleasure I get out of it, then I, why shouldn't I continue to do it?
Absolutely. Mm. No, no. Long may it last. Mm. I mean, you know, thanks a lot for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, no problem, my if, if you had to sort of pick from your whole repertoire three mm. songs that would sort of say, sort of sum you up as an artist, mm. what, what, what three would you choose, do you think? Yeah, that's interesting. Well, the serious side, I suppose, Alone Again, would always, people would always look upon that as a classic song. Um, I don't, what, Matrimony is a song. I'll tell you why Matrimony always, because it's almost like you, if every artist has a signature tune. Springsteen, Born to Run, who knows? Uh, Elton, I, what would Elton, maybe your song or something. The interesting thing with me, Matrimony is like a signature tune, but it was never a hit. Never a hit single. And yet it's the one song that, that people identify with me. So there's something very special about that. And then I would pick many of the other songs that I've recorded over the years, the, the Peggy Lee duet, Can't Think Straight. That would be very special. So there's your three. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, well, thanks a lot for your time. Pleasure. Anything else to say to Music News Watchers? No, just uh, enjoyed my interview with Marco. And uh, who knows, as I said earlier, maybe we'll end up going to his country to do a concert. That would be nice. I remember when Nothing Ryan was done by uh, Arabella, an Italian band. They had a massive success yeah, with it. Yeah. I remember <laughs> that. In fact, I have their record at home. I think it's Arabella or Alabella. Yeah, do you remember? Your dad will know all you are. Yeah, no, um, and the, so they just did a different lyric to it, but it was a huge success in Italy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So who knows? We no might go doubt. back there. Thank you very okay, much. Pleasure, my Thanks. Okay, cool.